All right. This is Terrence Long, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Yeah, this is a fascinating chat for everybody who's uh, tuning in. Terrence does something that's already incredible, but my perception of what it meant to do your job and the main reasons why are completely out of lack with what I discovered from your website and everything else. And of course, I want to highlight my uh, co-producer, co-host, Jeremy McCain, because he's like, hey, you got to have Terrence on. And so, Terry, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Can you hear me? Terry. Thanks for having me. Um, oh, I can, yes, I said thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Sorry. It's one of those. It was like one of those pauses where you're like, "Did we offend him? Is he angry?" Because <laughs> you were just. Oh, there. I, I just seen this circle going <laughs> around. Like. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. Well, so yeah, let me just start, Jeremy. Tell me uh, your thoughts on Terry and Terry's work, and why are we yeah. talking to him today? Yeah, and so uh, you know, Terry and I we met through mutual friend uh, George Rebellion, and uh, the way that George kind of pos positioned it to me, uh, I, I just first of all I love his brain and how he thinks about things. But he said, you know, did you ever have you did you ever know that that this, there's a lot of munitions in the water? And I said, well, I guess I kind of I know that that obviously we dump munitions in the water. I, I didn't really know a lot about it, to be truthful. I, I've learned a lot from, from Terrence, which I think all of you that are listening in the audience right now are, are going to probably walk away from this conversation and be like, holy crap, I never even realized that this is really what's happening. But um, I, I became interested in, in, uh, in this, and I had posted something on Facebook about a two munitions that were discovered on the uh, little uh, uh, Molokini island that's just off of Maui. And um, they were going to detonate, you know, basically. And, and I thought to myself, well, gosh, you know, what about the coral reef system? Or what, you know, and what, what are the options? Like, if you if you don't detonate them, then uh, what happens if someone goes snorkeling and then the, the thing blows up? Like, you know, there's just like this is it's just like a feedback loop of thoughts. It didn't really seem like there was kind of a, an end. And George said, hey, you know, what? there's this really amazing guy, Terrence Long. And what he's done, he's he focuses on underwater munitions. He's removed you know, hundreds, if not thousands of munitions out of the, out of the Baltic sea. And it's just amazing, amazing work. And, um, what I have learned in this sh very short amount of time is that, you know, w we have too much of this crap that's in the water and it's affecting not just the life in the oceans, but it's affecting us as humans. And I mean, I'll let Terrence kind of tell you all the, all the statistics there, but for me, I, I've been very impressed with what, what, what Terrence has done and what he's decided to dedicate his life to. Because as you can probably imagine, uh, talking about this stuff doesn't make him a really, you know, uh, popular guy. And <laughs> and you know, my dad used to always say that that uh, if you if you ruffle some feathers along the way because you're telling the truth, you're probably doing the right thing. Right. And I feel that way about Terry. Terry's very very knowledgeable about this stuff and, and I really don't need to be talking here. I, I, in fact, I guarantee you, I'm going to probably learn some more today. Just hearing Terry talk. Terry, teach us something. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy, that was, that was quite interesting. Uh, the introduction there. And I appreciate you for that. Uh, basically what a lot of people are not aware of is back in 1910 up until the mid 1970s, all the countries of the world, would take their unexploded bombs and rockets and artillery shells and sea mines and torpedoes and other kinds of, of munitions that became time expired because of safety devices and other reasons, and they would dump them in the ocean. And they would do this because it was a cheap means to dispose of these weapons rather than developing facilities to deal with them, to recycle, reuse some of the components and different types of things like that. So what happened back in the uh, 80s is uh, this organization started what they called the Chemical Weapons Convention. And uh, the group that manages it is the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. So within that group, Gosh, we got Terry in a little bit of a delay here. Yeah. Give it a second or two. This is the wonder of you know, modern communications. You and I, you're in Texas. I'm in California. I don't even know where Terry is. There he is. There he's back. Terry, I'm we lost the... you right when you got into the chemical group and then uh, you disappeared. So can you backtrack to that point? Yes, I'm in Canada and uh, I'll backtrack to that point. So we, have a chem 
So we have a chemical weapons convention that basically all the countries have signed an agreement that says all the chemical weapons that were dumped in the ocean before 1985 are not there. That's basically 99.6 of all the chemical weapons in the ocean. And then we have other weapons that are called conventional weapons. And those are like your TNTs, your RDX, your lead sulfide and mercury fulminate, all the bad chemicals. The only difference is they do a different thing. You know, they kind of blow you up where the other ones attack your immune system, they burn you and different types of things like that. So the convention also said that those munitions are not in the water. So what we had is we had all these countries develop a convention to sign away the liability for the past dumping that they've done. So what this is basically an amount to is a major daily 24 seven attack on the ocean with these toxins. While we sit here and talk about this, these toxins are in every ocean of the world, every sea, and they're releasing 24 seven. This is just a travesty. They're attacking the coral reefs, they're killing them, uh, they're, create, they're, they're creating algae blooms. Uh, the mustard gas is breaking down to inorganic arsenic and spreading across the seafloor, creating dead zones. And, and, and the list of impacts uh, on the environment just goes on and on and on. And when we started to investigate the sea life over in York, we started some chemical weapons programs because people in York were more proactive to look into this. North America don't want to hear about pollutants pollution. It, it, it's really unfortunate. So in New York, the, the people were more proactive. So we started three, four year chemical weapons programs and we started to investigate the, the munitions. And when we started to investigate these bombs and rockets and stuff sitting across the seafloor in shipwrecks, we started to find out that the chemicals that were in them, we were finding them in the seabed, the water and the fish. And then we found out later in the codfish, for example, that not only were we finding them, they were bioaccumulating in the fish, which were having a major impact. So in the cod, we found that they had stress on the kidneys, the livers, the inability for juvenile cod to reproduce, and we found cancers and tumors in the cod in the munition sites. So now when we left these sites full of bombs and rockets and we checked the fish, we, we didn't find this problem. We only found it in the actual sites. So we were able to determine from the science that we were doing that we were having a major impact on the ocean. So when we looked at that and we started to extrapolate that around the world, we started to say, well, wait a minute. The same problem we're having in the Baltic Sea, we're having in the Black Sea, in the Coast Sea, in the Red Sea, in the Mediterranean. And, and it just goes on like this all around the world. There's not a sea in the world that is not impacted from dump munitions, both chemical and conventional. So when we start to accumulate all this, we start to see that we have major point source emitters releasing pollutions into all the seas. So what has happened, because they've been doing this for over 100 years, some of the bombs and rockets, they started to meet one another, the chemical releases. So you can now go check the water in the ocean and actually see that some of the warfare agents are actually there where you don't find any munitions. So we talk about plastics and we talk about munitions. Well, plastic is a real problem we got to address, but everybody wants to address it. And what I call it is low hanging fruit. The munitions are a major impact with a half life of 5,000 years. Now you have to understand what you have to understand what that 5,000 years means. We're not sure how long it's going to pollute. So the best scenario that we can come up with, it is will be gone, or at least a half-life of it of being gone, will be in 5,000 years. So when you start to think about all these chemicals around the world freely drifting, we start to see the ocean is slowly becoming toxicity. We're getting a greater toxicity. So how does that happen? Well, at the Chemical Weapons Convention, they tell you chemical weapons like Clark 1 and Clark 2 agent hydrolyzes in water. But yet we detect these chemicals in the fish in the seabed in the water. So how can they hydrolyze and disappear magically if we detect them? So this is a major problem around the world. And I'm going to stop and let you ask some questions because I could go on for hours on the impact to the sea life and to humans. 
Well, let's just just uh, cover a term here. Um, what I think we all can kind of interpret what hydrolyzed means, but what does that mean? Like, what are they claiming is happening when things hydrolyze? Uh, basically, they're saying we can put this chemical in the water, remembering that your water is a bathtub when you combined all the oceans and the seas, and that it will just dis dissipate. It just disappears in the water. It just becomes part of water. It's no longer there. But the reality is it's a bathtub. And you can do this, but the more you put more chemicals and more chemicals and more chemicals, it's no longer clean water. You know, your benchmark that you started with of having a clean ocean was a clean ocean, but we don't have a clean ocean anymore. We have a sick ocean that is polluted and in some parts of the world is dying. The, yeah, I mean, you know, I, the, the thing that, that, that really kind of drives me nuts is that you know, how does it get there to begin with? Like, that's the, that's, I want to always look at the genesis. It's like, how do we get to this spot? You know, it's like, I guess, you know, obviously we, we, we make munitions because it's a, a way of, you know, securing our, our, our country, um, regardless of what country you're from. I mean, this is, you know, you have to have weapons of, of some kind. Um, otherwise, if the other guy next to you has weapons and you don't have any, well, you probably won't have a country. I mean, so that, that's kind of the world that we live in. Um, what happens when um, these munitions have to be destroyed? Like, what, what can you walk us through the process of why these munitions were even dumped in the first place and, and what the mindset was behind that? Um, again, just jumping back for a minute, there, you know, you had excess munitions. Some of them were time expired with safety devices in them, so you couldn't use them anymore because okay. you couldn't trust them. Some were, you know, basically obsolete, some were damaged, and some they just didn't want them anymore. So they would get, or they replaced the weapon with a new type of weapon. So they would get rid of them. Uh, when you have these weapons, the current main disposal being done today is to take more explosives, which is a toxin, put them on top of the underwater munition and blow them up in the water. Hmm. All that does is have a major impact on the environment. It has a, a sound propagation issue with the sea life. Mm -hmm. And what they started to do is, is, as they started to blow up munitions, they said, hey, you know, we just blew up sea, two sea mines. Well, let's blow up 100 sea mines. Let's blow up 1,000 sea mines at the same time. So our NATO forces, our North American Treaty Organization, recently started to dispose of munitions in the Baltic Sea, and they killed nine endangered porpoises. So this is what's happening. You, you're taking a soldier who was taught how to blow things up and you're giving them more bombs and you're saying, now go blow it up. Rather than countries investing money in underwater technology and non-destructive technologies, how to recover these munitions, take them back up onto the shore, put them in a proper facility and dispose of them, treating of all the off gases or dealing with the contaminants so they don't recontaminate the environment. Now you say, why should you do that? Well, if the half-life is 5,000 years for one munition, where most of them are unfused and you can pick them up out of the water and take them there, hmm. if you're gonna leave them in the water to continue to degrade, I'm sorry, but you don't need to clean up any plastics hmm. because you will not have an ocean when these munitions degrade. And what we have to realize is these munitions, some are degrading faster than others in different reasons. So in the Baltic Sea, 30% of all the fish tested in the Baltic Sea had warfare agents in it. Now these munitions are still degrading and degrading as we know it in the wow. Baltic Sea. So that 30% has nowhere to go up until it hits 100% because there is no recognition by no country hmm. that these munitions are hurting them because every country in the world is afraid of the liability. But what we've done is we proposed a United Nations Ocean Commitment to the UN number 21356. Now number 21356 is in the UN Ocean Registry to set up an innovative science and technology center in Canada and then regional underwater action centers so that we can actually train people, provide them the resources and work with the donor countries and clean them up on a need be basis. Now you have to understand the dilemma here. We have the United Nations saying that we must support sustainable development goal 14, life below water. 
Sorry, I think I stopped again. We no, must. You're good. We, you're good. Okay. You heard it. We must. Okay, we must support life below water. Uh, 14. So the munitions, the ambassador to the secretary general to the Security Council said they have to come out of the water. While the OPCW says leave them in the water, they're okay, guys. That you know they can't hurt hurt the fish. They can't hurt you. Out of sight, out of mind, they'll magically disappear. So we don't need to put countries on the position and tell them that they have to address liability. What we need to do is develop an international humanitarian trust fund where countries can commit and donate based on their ability to do so. And then from that fund, we need to work together from different countries to cooperate and go out and to go out and environmentally friendly, clean up the underwater munitions. And the best thing we can do now for the munitions, the best thing we can do is stop blowing them up. Hmm. Terrence, are there people that are, I mean, is there currently programs in place where they're at, at present still dumping munitions into the water? There are there there are some statements that some I don't know if you want to call them rogue countries or countries that don't normally follow international protocols. Uh, there are suggestions that they are dumping. There's also suggestions that some comp uh, countries have recovered complete munition ships with uh, the munitions on them, and we don't know why, but we can only assume it's been done for the scrap value. Hmm. Yeah, because, you know, one of the things with the plastic uh, argument that I have is, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about cleaning up the ocean and I, I, you know, plastic. And I think to myself, like if I had a leak in my bathroom and I open the door and it's just water spraying everywhere, um, the first thing I'm not going to grab is a bucket to collect, to collect the water. I'm most likely going to go and try to figure out how to stop the leak, how to stop the damage. And then I'm going to come back and do damage control and figure out how do I get all this crap up off my floor. Um, and I, and I, and that's the thing, that's the one thing I was, that's why I asked that question. It's like, well, if they're still dumping, you know, what can we do to, to stop that dumping? And then, you know, at the same time, not, not, not one doesn't come before the other, but you know, two in tandem running is like, how do we clean it up? And how do we, how do we stop them from dumping? Um, when you do go and say, okay, we're going to go clean these, these munitions up, could you maybe talk us through the process of, of what happens um, and where they go and how to do it in a, in a way that, that, that is not harmful? Sure. Um, I'll take you right back to the beginning. Uh, what we do first is we do historical research because we want to learn about the dumping. We want to learn how it was dumped, what was dumped, why, was why it was dumped, in order to develop a proper management plan to address it and to look at safety because, you know, we want to make sure that everybody's safe when we are recovering and disposing of munitions. So after the historical uh, research process and interviews as well, we're able to take that data and determine where we should go in a particular area to do a survey. Mm. So we'll go out, we'll do a survey uh, over the water. We can use a number of different technologies. Normally what we use is what we call an autonomous underwater vehicle. And our main uh, technology that we use on that are basically to side scan so we can kind of see what's on the surface and then magnetometer. And the reason we use a magnetometer is because then we can see what's beneath the surface and we can see any metals. And, and as you can imagine, a bomb and metals are, you know, the two of them are associated with one another. So we'll survey across that area. We'll identify where all the potential targets are. And then we'll say, okay, these are, are based on uh, certain criteria that we're using on that time based on the historical knowledge that we learned and the weapons and so on. We'll pick targets. And we'll go down to those targets to determine if they're actual underwater munitions. Now, when we go to the target, we don't use an AUV. We use a ROV, a remote operated vehicle. Mm. The big difference is it has a tender. And normally you can have manipulating arms or samplers and some other uh, type of technology on it. Where an AUV is going back and forth over the water on a mapping process, more or less. Mm -hmm. So you go down, you go down and you say, okay, you know, this is a, a munition. You try to identify what it is. You try to get too close to it as possible and take uh, some samples. And you want to bring the samples back because you want to know if you're dealing with a chemical weapon mm -hmm. or you want to know if you're dealing with a conventional weapon. Mm -hmm. Now this is important because in a conventional weapon, you're, you're dealing with a lot of heavy metals. Um, traditionally your footprint, of, uh, of toxin from that, from that particular area, if, if a trawler hasn't spread it, is normally about three 
maybe a max of four meters. Mm -hmm. Now on a chemical weapon, we have measured them from the, the point source as far as weight as 13 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So so you want to know what you're dealing with. You know, am I going to break this open? Is it going to leak and all this other stuff? So it's very right. important. So you collect your data. You mm -hmm. do your analytical work. You know, you go back to your books and double check everything and you determine what you are, what, what you have. And then based on, on what you have, you determine what your disposal process is. Okay. Now, I, I am totally against blowing it up because you just spread more explosives across the C4, more metals and so on. Yeah. But by recovering it, we actually take back the heavy metals. What a lot of people don't realize is if you use injection technology in the water mm -hmm. and you leave the casing behind, every casing we checked had a minimal of 155 parts per million lead. And we have a major problem with lead in the ocean. Right. So we don't want to go out playing with injection technologies mm -hmm. and, and leaving that stuff there. We need to recover this stuff and, and we need to dispose of it. So when we recover it, recover it, there's a number of different ways to recover it. You can do it remotely. You can put balloons onto it, float it up to a surface, put it in a basket and drag it into your, your facility and everything can be done with what we call hooks and lines and everything's moving and no person is ever touching anything. Mm. So we don't put anybody at risk. So when it goes into a, a chamber, a, a number of different processes can happen. Uh, some of these chambers have a chemical process. Uh, some of them have a heating process where they mm. heat up the explosive to the actually incinerated inside of it. And some of them actually have a process where they put more explosives in, has a donor charge, and they mm. blow it up inside the cylinder. Now, when they blow it up inside the cylinder or the detonation chamber, all the off gases are treated. So mm. you're not putting anything back into the environment. Yeah. So we've been talking about bombs and rockets under the water. So... What a lot of people don't know that associates with this and why it's so serious is hundreds of thousands of tons just in the U.S. alone mm -hmm. every year now because it's not being dumped into the ocean is being what we call open burned and open detonation. So mm -hmm. they're taking munitions. They're putting these munitions that they would have dumped into the ocean in trays of diesel oil mm -hmm. and they're burning them. Mm -hmm. And this is going on today as we speak. So, so you, 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 you bring these things in, they detonate and you do all this stuff. What, what is the byproduct that's left over after you've, you've successfully treated these munitions in your facility or, or someone's facility or however it works? Uh, there's different pro byproducts depending what you're, you're dealing with. The, the main product out there right now in the conventional munitions are TNT. Mm -hmm. So some of the stuff you have to deal with there is you have to cut it up into smaller chunks so you can actually deal with it. You can't put a couple of hundred pounds into the detonation chamber. You can only put a couple of pounds in at a time. Right. So you can imagine what, you know, if you look at what you call throughput, how quick can I get this stuff through? Yeah. It, 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 this is why we need to invest and develop new technologies. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, looking at looking at that process, it can be a long time. Yeah. So, I, so you know, like like for instance, when uh, I, I looked at pyrolysis from the, on the plastic solution, right? It's where they right. essentially, for those of you who don't know, pyrolysis is a, is a method where we take you know hard, very heavy plastics, and they're just heated up until they start to um, off gas, and then that off gas is going through a chamber and to where there's a water vat and it cools it down super fast and now what you get is you get the petroleum that kind of floats on the surface and it siphons off and that can be recycled into fuel and jet a and all those other kinds of things um you know so so but it, it but what's left in that heating vat is essentially just it's like carbon that's all that's left over you could crunch that up put it in your garden if you wanted to um you know it's probably not the best thing to put in your garden come to think of it but you could do that um in in the case of you know you you've heated up these munitions, say you've only done ten pounds of TNT, and you've now neutralized it in some way. W where does it go from there? Uh, after the red waters are treated, and that it can actually go back into the landfill cycles, back within the the recycle system itself. It actually meets the uh, guidelines in in most cool. areas at that particular time. That's cool. I want to get an idea of just how big this problem is today and then how fast it's growing. I mean, you can say there's sure. hundreds of thousands of this or that or whatever. But yeah, sure. Yeah. What is it like? What are we talking about? And then how long, like if we stopped today and not one more munition was purposely dumped, you know, or gotten rid of and we're not talking about things falling off a ship accidentally or a plane going down, you know, how, how long would it take us if we got our hands on it today to, to 
safely get rid of this. I mean, what on earth does it cost to do this? I mean, something that's 3,000 feet down in, the, down in the water cannot be cheap to go get, even with an ROV. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct. In a dilemma, um, I worked extensively. I'm a retired chemical weapons uh, uh, expert. I worked on landmines, landmine treaty, and different types of things like that. So when back in 1996, when we were working on the landmine treaty, we started to realize that countries invested 50 years in how to deploy these weapons, but never on how to recover and clean them up. Now, the same thing has happened with the underwater munitions. So we find ourselves in a dilemma here, but the dilemma can be turned into an opportunity for the private sector to develop these new and emerging technologies, right? So when you look at cost, I mean, we haven't invested. We haven't got out there and played with this stuff and in the sense that we need what we call a technology demonstration program where several companies come to the table and they demonstrate their different technologies. And then some of those technologies are selected to move into a next process to see which ones are better. See, the, the, the militaries in the countries, they go, well, we got the chemical weapons uh, convention. And according to that, those weapons aren't there. So so why do we invest? And, and that's what's happening today. Um, uh, I, I cannot tell you how many letters I've written to Prime Minister Trudeau and other prime ministers before him and got no response. Um, even Canada, where people think we're this great environmental country and we talk about sustainable development goals and how we're going to do this and how we're going to do that. It's all buzzwords. It's all sound bites for politicians to get reelected. In Nova Scotia here, we have more than 3,000 munition sites. Some of them right in the oil and gas. Some of them are going to be directly impact by seismic operations, for an example. In the middle of the island that I'm on, I'm on Cape Breton Island, and I have a lake. It's a UNESCO biosphere lake. Now, this lake is full of munition sites, and it's only recently that the government was forced to admit through access to information that the sites actually exist. So as we leave Nova Scotia and we go into the Gulf, we're full of munition sites in the Gulf. As we go up the St. Lawrence Seaway towards the Great Lakes, we're full of munition sites. As we get into the Great Lakes, every Great Lake has munition sites. As we come down the eastern seaboard of the United States, there's, there's uh, Baker, for an example, dump site Baker. Uh, there's all kinds of chemical nuclear sites all along that seaboard, the eastern seaboard. And now if you come back to Canada and I said Nova Scotia is full of these sites, well, if you go up to Newfoundland, which is just 90 miles across from my island, we have all kinds of sites that have been created by the United States. We have a nuclear, radiological, and an ammunition site all in the same dump site where we actually went into it and found nuclear isotopes and things like that. So what we need to do is we need to invest. We all need to learn from one another. We need to cooperate on these international dialogues so we can come together and start working and to develop these technology. So you cannot quantify a cost on this because we haven't invested in anything in the disposal process. So right now the cost is out of reach and the only way we can put that cost into a reach is actually look at the economic value of the ocean and the sea life and then look at what countries are willing to do to respond to protect their own marine resources. So Canada, for an example, because they're not cleaning up these marine resources, the white whales are dying. Some of them are di dying from fishing nets and stuff like that. But some of them are becoming toxic from the toxins in the water. But the Canadian government, for an example, will study everything but the munition sites, or they'll go back to the military and ask the military to respond to it. And the military has no right to respond to this because they are tasked with defending the countries with the operational munitions. These are legacy munitions. This is waste right. that they left behind because they didn't want to deal with it. Well, when, frankly, that's an executive mm -hmm. branch thing. That yes. has to be guided by the prime minister of the president and the king, whatever yes. the queen. That, it's got to be because the military will do what they say. Like, like uh, in the mid-90s, you know, this is like 97. Uh, we got a tasking from Congress to say, look through all of your files, all of them, for anything pertaining to the Kennedy assassination. All of your files. We didn't want to do this, but there we were, through each piece of paper looking for anything that said Kennedy on it. And it took a long time. 
So, I mean, you're talking about an executive branch, legislative branch type thing where you compel the military to do what it is because you're right. They're not worried about that. They're following within the guidelines they've been given until we do something different. It's uh, it's crazy. John, uh, my co-host, uh, co-founder of the show, says, do we know the effects to human beings when contaminated fish are part of our diets? We, we haven't actually been able to do any studies where we actually followed the fish from the table uh, right into human consumption, but some are being done right now in Germany, and those results should be made available uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, if you realize when I talked about the chemical weapons programs in Europe, what we did is we developed the weight of evidence. In our first program, Kemsey, you know, we found the cancers and the tumors in the fish, and then we started to find the the inorganic arsenic spreading across the seafloor, and then we found found the plumes 13 kilometers away. So that, that's what we've been doing the last almost close to 15 years now is developing the weight of evidence so we can actually clean this stuff up. Unfortunately, is every time we develop a piece of a weight of evidence, the defense departments of the world put out a lot of money to develop a new message of what we actually say. So if we say, you know, the munition can hurt you, they have a toxic effects. We usually get the response is the munition cannot hurt you and the coral reefs love them. Love them. By the way, yes. look at this. You're in lights. <laughs> I don't want to be in lights. The fish want to be in lights because it's the fish that need our help. If we don't come out and protect the, the global declining fish stocks, there's there's not going to be any folks. Yeah. Right now, most of you are unknowingly eating contaminated fish. If you live in Delaware, you're probably most likely eating contaminated fish because on a number of occasions they have recovered chemical weapons and they brought them right back to the facilities where the fish is canned and then they had to dispose of it. But yet the vessels went right back out to the munition sites fishing again in the same waters. So just because they didn't bring the bomb in the next time doesn't mean they didn't bring the toxins. You know, I, I have a question. You know, you, you mentioned something a little bit earlier, and I know we've had discussions about this before, but, you know, if there are munitions and chemical weapons that are sitting on the seafloor, whether they're deep or or just a relatively short, um, you know, shallow areas, I don't know. Um, is there any threat of uh, a bad actor coming in and saying, hey, I'm going to recover these munitions so I can make a dirty bomb or, or, or an explosive of, of some kind? I mean, because I think that if that was a real threat, I would think nations would want to step up and do something about it. Uh, th that's a real threat. It's a, let me put it in, in U.S. terms. It's a clear and present danger. Hmm. It really is. And some, but the problem is that some countries use that as an excuse that I, got, I don't have to tell you where the munitions are. And, you know, that really goes against what you're trying to do. There has been people, there has been people who have picked up munitions and have died picking them up in Canada, the United States, and many other mm -hmm. countries. There have been children that have picked them up in Nova Scotia and Halifax on a beach and drove them halfway across Canada to Toronto in the family car, mm -hmm. putting the family and everybody at risk along the route from these weapons. And, you know, if you go to the Halifax beach, there's not even a sign there that tells you don't pick up these bombs. Yeah. So this is what's going around the world is is all these countries are hoping everything remains out of sight and out of mind. And then, you know, the security threat, it just disappears. The human health threat, it just disappears. And the weapons have been recovered by fishermen in the past and has been used in a terrorist attack. And when we talk about quantifying this, um, a question that was earlier, we have records where one dumping alone Canadian forces and Dutch forces in the North Sea dumped 6.5 million tons mm. of conventional weapons. So it's really easy to go out and recover conventional explosives. I'm not going to go through the rest of the process what to do, but also recover a chemical weapon and make a weapon of mass destruction. Mm. Um, this is my biggest fear because by not taking part in this expression, you know, the, the horse by the reins or the bull by the horns and trying to do something about it by continually letting it run loose. Mm. You know, when we look at it at a later date, 
the problems that it's going to create from human health, we may not be able to fix it. We may not be able to fix those ecosystem problems or those fish problems because we allowed it to go too long. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. In, in, in an area uh, between Germany and Denmark, the codfish continually spawn in mustard gas beds. Jesus now, Christ. all of the cod, all of the cod there, because they've been spawning there for dozens of years, they all have cancer now. So, if you remove the, the weapon and the and the and the cod continue to spawn, they will still get cancer because now it's a genetic, because we never took it out of the environment; it became genetic. And and, and this is why, you know, some people say, "Well, Mr. Long, you get too upset, Mr. Long. You know, you you know, settle back. This this is really not like that." No. I'm getting upset because I'm the weapons expert. They're not. I'm the one who's been dealing with the sciences for the last 15, 16, 17 years. They're not. And I'm trying to sound the alarm. And our politicians are not listening because nobody holds them accountable today. They just, you know, turn the other way, give you a sound bite and get on with the next thing. Mm. So let me leave you with one That's a tease. That's a tease. It's yeah, the cliffhanger. <laughs> We're gonna leave. There he is. He's back. I think. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, thought he was back. It's a second tease. A double know. cliffhanger. A... Where the opposition leader in Russia was poisoned with what they call numchuck chemicals. Now, when I go to the chemical weapons convention in November, where I'm supposed to talk about underwater munitions. No one will be able to talk about this. The only thing they will be able to talk about is those nunchuck chemicals in Russia. Hmm. And, and this, so this is what we deal with. So next year will be some other excuse or hmm. some other reason. In 2015 was the closest I got countries to do something at the Chemical Weapons Convention. We actually had several countries calling for the removal. And then it only takes one country to say, well, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And then it's off the table. So we really need to look at that chemical weapons convention because these people may have to take that arms control convention and say, well, we're going to look at all the human health and environment and give that to the United Nations because mm -hmm. we can't deal with it. We can't talk to Terry Long. We mm -hmm. can't talk about the fish. We can only talk about the use of the weapon. Well, if you can only talk about the use of the weapon, continue that, please. But let's turn this over to the United Nations and take it away from the OPCW. So you know, the other thing I, I want to ask, too, is that, you know, there are a number of marine sanctuaries and marine protected areas ar around in U.S. waters and elsewhere. Um, I had a conversation with someone at NOAA not too long ago, and uh, it was about a specific uh, marine protected area. And um, one of the comments that was made was that there was, and I quote, significant uh, military assets in those waters and I'm, I'm listening to you talk and i'm just recalling that conversation i'm wondering when they say military assets are they maybe perhaps including dump munitions I, i'm sure they're including dump munitions but it it really you know the individual who responded to that and you know what defense side you're from and, and things like that to order to try to read what they're asking you there or what they're trying to say yeah I'm just curious because I know that in, in some cases it seems like, uh, you know, th there have been a lot of marine parks that have been created um, in places where there's a significant amount of munitions. And I'm wondering if that's kind of like, you know, smoke and mirrors kind of thing saying, hey, look, we, we made this marine sanctuary, you know, then just kind of like hiding the fact that there might be something in the water. Does that happen a it's, lot? It's pretty ironic that most of the marine sanctuaries that are being identified today and that's been identified for the last several years in Canada, for an example, and even with the United Nations and their country members, uh, are in munition sites. And I actually believe, I actually believe this is being done so they can avoid doing anything with the munitions. Hmm. What what is the great rejection of this? I mean, obviously, we know that any fish spawning in a mustard gas zone. We all know that we can't just continue to dump things in the ocean. And I, I'm sure people are doing it illicitly on the side. Like, hey, oops, these 40, 40 tons of uh, whatever old obsolete things are getting dumped. But wh why why the pushback? I mean, you're right. We're worried about fucking straws. And, you know, we have 
probably VX gas. I mean, all kinds of horrible things in the ocean that we're not even willing to discuss, let alone figure out how to clean up. Well, the first thing, because it's a weapon, it's easy to say, oh, we don't need to discuss this. It's a secret. It's a military. And a lot of people buy that. Uh, next excuse is there's no technology, so we don't need to look at it either. Next one is there's no money, so we don't need to do it. Uh, there's no political will and, and, and so on. So when you look at the weapons, you know, I look at different countries. And when I look at Canada, I, I go through documents and I read how the Department of Defense was boasting that they could dump 50 tons a week. And then I look at uh, in the ocean and they did this for months on end. And then I look at, at um, you know, one of the ships from the United States coming up from Virginia and dumping weapons off of Nova Scotia for four and a half straight months. And then I look at Germany and, you know, just in the German waters alone, there's 900,000 sea mines. So, you know, when you want to start going around the world and, and, and start looking at the cost and looking at the actual, you know, how many munitions are out there and is it a real problem? It all gets back to liability. These countries don't want to talk about that because then they become responsible to clean it up. But now in Europe, they're looking at putting 500 million euros in place right now with the European Union to start this process because we developed the weight of evidence. But it's been impossible to develop that weight of evidence in North America with the political with the current political situation. Well, where do we go from here, Terrence? I mean, I think, you know, a, a lot of us that are probably listening here are thinking, you know, okay, well, this is definitely a problem. It needs to be addressed. Um, a lot of people are probably listening to the show right now thinking, well, that's that's a depressing topic to, to learn about today. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just a guy who, you know, does X, Y, or Z. You sure. Know, what kind of involvement could I possibly yeah. have to make any kind of impact? Yeah, there, you know, there's there's kind of kind of two things here. It's political and funding. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the chicken in the egg. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, if we had funding to support our United Nations uh, uh, action 21356 to actually set this center up, start training people and go up and clean it up, we would be able to make an impact and no one would be able to stop us. If we had political will and they were saying, hey, well, you know what, we need a new treaty on underwater munitions. And, and uh, we need to look at the human health so the fish can live, you know, then, then that's really what we need to do. And uh, if we can get people just talking about that, you know, we need to fund cleanup and we need to change the perspective of the politicians. So we need everybody listening to this show today to create their own public awareness on underwater munitions. Go to the Internet, look up underwater munitions, go Terry Long international dialogue, human health, environment, and start coming up with some of the some of the stuff and start spreading the word around in your community and start getting involved in more podcasts. And so I would love to do another dozen podcasts as long as people are becoming aware of the problem. I am so tired of, of being alone or feeling that I'm alone is that I need support. And the fish need to know that there's other people there helping too as well, because words don't do it anymore. Words are only words. You got to get out and do the walk. Get off Facebook. Stop telling people you hate this. Get up off the chair if that's where you are. Sorry, I don't mean anything by that. But please chair, come so out and help us. Okay, get off your chair, Jeremy, right. and get over here and help us. <laughs> <laughs> done and done. No, I think that's I think that's wise advice. I mean, because I think you know. We sometimes think we're helpless, but we're not. Like you know, what it's it's. Uh, I, I think there's there are a lot of things that we can we can all do, and and I'm glad that you you positioned it that way. I mean, I I took on ocean conservation as just a you know average, you know redhead stepchild essentially. <laughs> you know, I was a guy who was really really passionate about you know oceans uh, issues, and and uh, you know, and, and that's kind of led me where I am now. Um, and I think like you know, it doesn't matter who you are on this planet. And the thing that we all need to remember is that really we need to stop thinking about this as a planet we need to stop thinking about this as a country but we are all brothers and sisters uh crew members of spaceship earth and we're pummeling through space and what's really interesting is a lot of times we talk about you know we use that phrase well 71 percent of the earth's surface is water well a news flash if we were to take you know think about the amount of earth there is versus the amount of water there is and if we were to, to put this to scale and we had a tennis ball that would represent the earth that is on our planet. And then basically an eraser head on the tip of a pencil would represent the amount of water that is just on the surface of that, of that tennis ball. Um, 
it is an extremely limited resource. And by, you know, thinking that it's just an endless uh, trash pit, um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're really asking for trouble. I mean, we use the phrase, well, this is what happens when you talk too long. Your, your own lights apparently shut off <laughs> because I didn't plug them in. How about that? So this is the dark part of the, uh-huh. of the, of the oh, we'll, I'll go we'll dark that. with you. I'll turn my I'll fix, off I'll too. fix that one in a minute. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think I think when we think about throwing things away, we have to remember that away doesn't exist, and um, and so I think this is such a really good conversation um, because you know, Terrence, you, you've really kind of opened my eyes to this stuff, and uh, I've not you know realized this um, until I don't know. We've been talking for what maybe a month, uh, and you know, this is just as much as important as plastic, overfishing, slavery at sea. All of these things are, are, are really contributing to the demise of, of, of the, the ocean. And you know what? That's where we all came from. That's what sustains life on this planet is the largest carbon sink. And it is our duty as crew members of Spaceship Earth to, to, to fix this problem. Let me see if I can. It's also the largest back. mustard gas sink, apparently. Well, too. apparently, yeah. Oh, there we go. Back there you are. Welcome back. Uh, I wanted to. Ask I had to go dark part. for that for that, that, that little monologue there. <laughs> Super dark. <laughs> Terry, is there hope? Uh, yes, I, I, I think there is hope because um, part of the expression, I'm pig-headed and I'm not going to give up. And I'm going to continue this fight as long as I can speak and, and, and stand. And uh, I see the question come through earlier by Mary, and I apologize. It's the first question I've seen. If I would have seen questions, I, I would have I responded. And Mary asked about, uh, can you recycle this? And, and, and you can. There, you can recycle this. You can, for an example, you can take the metals and you can melt them down. They've actually uh, done that with shipwrecks to uh, rebuild four of the last 20 uh, frigates that they built in Canada. Uh, These bombs and rockets are all mass metals. You can actually wash out the explosives. About 80% of them in the ocean are not fused. So by being not fused, it means you can pick them up and you're not going to set them off. It's actually the fuse with more sensitive explosive that sets off the munition. So yeah, you can recycle this stuff. Um, I'm sure you can burn the TNT and the RDX and actually create energy out of it as long as you're treating the off gases. I mean, we could do everything. The problem is there's no political willness. And then the governments or, or the politician, they go right back to the military and the military says, oh, it's okay. But they're gone to the wrong person and everything is politics. So. There, do you think there could be an, a potentially use as an energy source here? Oh, no, there is an energy short, source. Really? Uh, no no potential. There is. I, I mean, you just got to look up what the chemicals are and, 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 and how reactive they are and, and, mm. and how that responds into a heat, uh, even, thermal even energy a, and stuff a like that. that's been there in the ocean for like 50, 60 years, you could still use that for energy? Most of them, yes, but now you've got you you got to quantify that that questions that you just asked because mm-hmm. if the weapon is open and water seeping into this and it's become waterlogged, that's a whole different story. Okay. Most okay. of these casings are just have very little small leaks in them, mm-hmm. and the ones that um, say the chemical weapons and stuff like that that are, are are really leaking. Most of them are leaking because of being moved around because of seismic and other different activities that are that are taking on the ocean. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with this people can make money off of this governments can make money off of this you can turn around and take your fish and you can say how much mercury or lead is in my tuna and now that i removed those munitions there and if i can find an area with low lead and mercury i can say guess what because all the uh, uh, fish in the world have lead and mercury in it and this has lower i'm going to call this organic fish and that's what the japanese do when they sell their tuna and they actually you know you hear getting all this money for a tuna fish that's how one of the ways they do it they call it orga- organic because it's low in mercury and lead so you know the huh. other thing is is we're talking about the toxins and a few times i said uh, lead and mercury and and you really need to to listen and and when you say tnt basically a nitrogen in the water too as well that's right. decaying so when we look at climate change you know what's the greatest climate action we can do for this planet today hmm. if i pull one munition out of the water that has a ha- half life of 5000 years mm-hmm. wow did i just do a lot for the fish wow. so imagine if we pulled them all out of the water and then somebody will say well you can't pull them all out of the water because you'll stir up so much seabed you'll make a mess well we can stir up the seabed for oil and gas pipelines. Mm. We can stir up the seabed for trawling. Mm. Why can't we stir it up to pull out a point source emitter 
that is actually covered under international protocols and that are not allowed to be in the water. But the only reason they're there is because they developed a political body, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and the Chemical Weapons Convention that, that is basically a blank check to say you don't have to do nothing with those munitions. Well, I think so if you put something that, there, you should take it back. I mean, it's it's one thing, you know, deep sea mining, mm, Pete, we've taught this, had this discussion yep. before. It's like we have no business going to the seafloor and mining the deep sea, you know, but, but I think that if we've put, you know, essentially what amounts to trash and, and that the seafloor and we can turn it into energy and maybe we can even salvage some of the metals as well. I mean, it sounds like a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I, I, I do a lot. I shouldn't say I do a lot. I do some work with oil and gas and, and different companies and things like that. But I don't see no real risk mitigation or no willingness there to address the munitions. Mm. If, if you look at the Deepwater Horizon, for an example, I cannot tell you that that blew up from a munition. But I can tell you that that was drilling in the middle of a documented munition site. Mm. And even if it wasn't a bomb or a rocket, we now know what the potential threat is. So all around the world, we have, I told you earlier, about 6.5 million tons. Mm. There are other areas where there are 80,000, 40,000, 30,000, four or five shipwrecks full of munitions, 200 shipwrecks in a five square kilometer dump site. These munitions, if you set off one, they can sympathetically dead off, uh, set off the other munitions. Now, has munitions degrade in the water? On land, we have what we call 30% propagation. In other words, if 30% of that munition degrades into the soil, that soil might be energetic where we could actually set it off because it's now shock sensitive. Hmm. It's a lot more underwater. But what's happening, it's getting greater all the time to where eventually this is going to happen. This will happen. It's just a matter of time of where and when and by who. That's amazing, amazing insights. And I, you know, I'm, I'm always, I always love listening to you because I feel like there's just, I can never get enough. This is just amazing stuff. And then and the other light goes out. I mean, this is, this is, <laughs> this is like a Mickey Mouse show over here. Sorry about that, guys. Um, and, uh, but what I was going to say, uh, this is like, my lights are like, wrap it up. It's like the music at the, at the Oscars. There's, there's a violin going to start playing any minute. Um, you, you know, what, what can we do to support you? I mean, you know, I, I know, um, I know. I think we had your your website up and running here on the on the ticker. But is that is that where we would go to help you know donate to you know the removal of munitions? Uh, yes, you could go there and you could uh, look at the site, learn information. Uh, you could donate as well too. Uh, there are movies we have: Deadly Depths, Footprints of War, uh, a short film, Baltic Sea Bomb Hunters, different types of things like that that you can learn more about the underwater munitions. Hmm. But our greatest struggle is trying to put funding together to purchase land and to build this center. And we need to partner with people, even the private sector who has technologies for underwater vehicles or AUVs or disposal or handling or vessels or stuff like that. We need you to become part of the team on this United Nations 21356 because it's about bringing everybody together. It's not about the international dialogue cleaning this up. It's about the international dialogue being the focal point or the coordination point to bring everybody together so that we can all do this together. Okay. So we need your help. We need your funds. We have no core funding to do anything. Uh, I'm a retired serviceman and basically I use what I can from month to month to, to try to do something. But I believe in what I, I'm doing and I know if you learn more, you too will believe in this. And, and, and I just welcome any help from anybody. Yeah, and I wanted to thank you for coming on, and, and let's yeah, let's try to do another one of these shows because again, like this is not, this is such a problem. Like in my head, I'm like, okay, it's UXO underwater, and we've got to get it out so people aren't harmed by a World War II bomb exploding. Turns out that's not even on the iceberg. Okay, maybe that's a little piece of the iceberg, not even the tip though. That's such a yes, never touch UXO. Point it out, and then <laughs> hopefully someone comes and cleans it. But this is mustard gas and. Right munitions and, mm. and oh, mercury yeah. and stuff. Horrible. Hey, horrible. If you if you wanted to in the if you wanted to in the future, you know, something that I think would be good is we could have a designated show on talking about where all the sites are. And then you could have one show talking about all the science and people could ask the science questions. And and, and then you could have, you know, the final third show say on the solution and the way forward and how do we all come together. 
Yeah, well, let me get a, a an ocean smart tech guy to come on the show and uh, <laughs> a real. Well, um, well I, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. There is uh, we have an international science board of sixteen scientists from ten different countries, Perfect. and they're all act in their own independent uh, uh, expertise. They so they don't you know re relate to a government or something like that. And one of our scientists is Professor James Porter, and he won the twenty eighteen Peabody Award for the movie Chasing Coral for his work on Coral Reef. Now, James and I have been working together for the last 15 years on this issue. And James is our what we call our conventional weapons expert. And we also have a chemical weapons expert that sits in Poland, which is Joski Podolski. And we have people in different countries. So we're all trying to address this. So, you know, maybe what we could do is have James come on and he could actually bring you right down to the science and from, from his perspective, where I'm a weapons expert and he's more of a scientist and, and, and I think it would be more beneficial to your viewers and allow more for an exchange. I love it. I love it. Anything else, Jeremy? No, I'm just, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we, I think we covered pretty much the gamut and I think that it's, 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 it's interesting because I think, you know, a lot of times we're in these cities, we live in LA, we live in Dallas, New York, wherever. And, you know, we, we just carry on business as usual. You know, we go to Whole Foods and, you know, or, or whatever place that we go to that we that we get our groceries and we just we order the food that we're going to eat we're going to come my the, the one question that my wife always has that i absolutely hate because i just it's like the same question every single day it feels like groundhog day but what are we going to eat for dinner and you know it, it's not like i'm going to go out and kill anything you know i live in the middle of the city you know and yeah. there's nothing here that you would want to eat that you could go kill um so Me we too. go to the store and that's where we get all of our food um but i think sometimes when you get so much into that mindset you you fail to realize really what's actually happening and really what you are eating, and I think you know we know that you know bioaccumulation happens with plastic and nano and uh, microplastic particles, but you know that also happens with mercury. It also happens with now now that we've learned TNT, and it's like you oh know God. yeah. Uh, so I think I think when we are aware of these things that we can have kind of a better take on things, and so I I, I for one um, you know I I think it helps me as a dad as a husband to to make better decisions, you know, for my family. But at the same time, as Terrence says, you know, get off the chair, man, go do something. And, you know, I think Terrence has given us some real good insight on what some of those things can, can be. And, you know, um, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second here. Everybody always says vote. Yeah. Fuck that. Okay. Vote. But that's, <laughs> the least, that's the least you can do, you know, like, Act. you know, yeah, act. It doesn't have to be this. It, it, you can act within your government. You can act within an NGO. You can act all mm -hmm. over the place. And here's an you area just where be a good person, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let, let me let me leave you with a thought. Then, sorry, um, you right, just perfect. you 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 hit me with something that that that's important to me. Let, let me leave you with a thought. You said, "How can people help?" We really need help on generating and writing proposals in particular reasons where there are a problem and finding out what is the marine group in that particular area. And let's write a proposal to them and let's go in and check the munitions in that area and see what the impact are and then come up with, you know, some simple solutions to risk mitigate those. Um, so we're always looking for any volunteers that can help us write that can help us generate a monthly newsletter or that can help us generate public awareness. That's where we need the help there in financial, of course, and political. Well, let's do another one soon. Thank you so much, Terry, for coming on the show. Thank you, Jeremy, for another great guest. It's always awesome. And I love learning about the ocean because, you know, we only got really, really only have one. Ocean. We only we have like one. Say it's yeah. several, That's right. It, one. It's one. Yeah. Yeah. It includes the Great Lakes. It includes the Persian Gulf. It includes all kinds of things, and we should take care of all of it. All right, let me uh, let me sign off. Here. Stand by.